As far as the eye can see, there's not the least bit of land to disturb the perfect harmony of sea and sky. Lost somewhere in the heart of the Indian Ocean, thousands of kilometers from the shores of Africa and the Indian coast, the Seychelles Islands were for a long time off the main maritime routes. Vasco da Gama, on his second voyage to India in 1502, did in fact sight some islands to the northeast of Madagascar, but he didn't stop there. The Indian and Arab navigators, the unrivaled masters of the Indian Ocean at the time, would occasionally venture into the zone of the Seychelles, but they never settled there. The Seychelles made their true entry into the history books at the beginning of the 17th century as a refuge for the pirates plundering the ships of the East India Company on their way back to Europe, their holes heavy with gold and spices. The legend of the Seychelles with their stories of fantastic pirate treasure date back to those days. Despite the accuracy of the hydrographic readings, the reliability of navigation instruments like radar, the GPS, and sounding devices, which would ensure safe sailing in the area, most ships still avoid the bank of the Seychelles. So we feel a bit like explorers as we approach the shores of Prala. And yet, reading the logbook of John Jordan, a navigator for the English East India Company who landed in the Seychelles in 1609, we can realize just how much the ecosystem of the island has changed since those days. January 19th, about 9 o'clock in the morning, we sighted land to the southeast. At three in the afternoon, we sighted a cluster of islands which seemed to be four in number. January 22nd, we found many coconuts, both ripe and green, of all sorts, and much fish and fowl and turtles. On one of these islands, within two miles of where we landed, there is a good timber, as ever I saw, of length and bigness, and a very firm timber. You shall have many trees of sixty and seventy feet without sprigs except at the top, very big and straight as an arrow. It is a very good refreshing place for wood, water, coconuts, fish and fowl, without any fear or danger except the alligators. The May Valley in the center of the island of Prala is a veritable nature sanctuary, reminiscent of the primeval forest. Unlike the rest of the island, this lush palm grove had remained basically unspoiled by human presence until 1930. Apart from the turtles and the crocodiles, which were exterminated quite early, the ecosystem of the May Valley has remained fairly close to what it was at the beginning of the 17th century. When the pirates and the others came here, it was mainly for the good wood to repair their ships, for water and meat, because there used to be a lot of giant turtles here. You can keep them at least two months without food or water, and they'll stay alive. And that was very important before refrigeration was invented. The May Valley gives you an idea of what all praline looked like 200 years ago. From the point of view of biodiversity, it's a very important reserve for all the plant and animal life. You can find all the native species here. Among all the different species of plants that shelter in the May Valley, the coco de mer, or double coconut, is by far the most remarkable. Each of the coco de mer palm trees, which they say can live up to 400 years, is numbered, protected, watched over, and each fruit is considered a treasure. When you look at the fruit, it looks like a green heart. And when you strip off the fiber, the seed inside has a very erotic shape.
Le nom scientifique, c'est le Lodoicia. The scientific name is Lodoicia maldivica. It belongs to the family of the dioecious plants, meaning there are male plants and female plants. The male plants grow a catkin almost one meter long, covered with yellow flowers. The strange thing is that it gives off an odor and at the same time produces a lot of pollen. The female plant has flowers that can yield as many as nine fruits. The tree doesn't flower until it's 21 years old. The fertilization then takes seven years which means that to produce a fruit, it takes at least 28 years. Today, three centuries after being discovered, there's a new kind of pirate landing on the Seychelles. Tourism has now become one of the main resources of the archipelago. And what makes the charm of the Seychelles, in addition, of course, to the heavenly beaches that line the shores of the salty water, as the Creoles poetically call the Indian Ocean, is its inhabitants, a mixed population born of French and English colonization, French and English slavery. Strolling through the market in the capital Victoria, you quickly realize that, in addition to the variety of skin colors, the thing that truly embodies the multicultural history and character of Seychelles society is, without question, the Creole language. The Creole Institute has its headquarters in this old colonial mansion. Their mission is not only to codify, but also to cultivate the color and creativity of the Creole language. We speak Seychellois Creole, the language of the Seychelles. The lexical base is French, and it's true that most of the Seychellois Creole words are French words. But there is also a theory that the syntax comes from African languages. All during the French and English colonial periods, the Seychelles were simply a territorial dependency of Mauritius. With the same history and the same language, these sister islands of the Indian Ocean forged close economic and commercial ties that were long maintained through the schooner traffic. I'm 83 years old, I'm married, and my Portuguese from my father's side and French from my mother's side. My grandfather came to the Seychelles back in the days of slavery. 
Later, he married a Seychelles woman named Estery. I started working when I was nine. I was just a kid. Later, I embarked on a boat named the Jolinda and went to Mauritius. We loaded copra at Galiga and took it to Mauritius. I did that for a year. The captain was English, Captain Vos. When I landed in 1945, I took the test to be captain of that boat. Well, the good boats? Oh, yeah, very, very sturdy. All that's gone now. No more boats. All that's over and done with. Up until the beginning of the 18th century, the French processions in the southern Indian Ocean were limited to the Ile Bourbon and the Ile de France, the names of Reunion and Mauritius under the kings of France. So the Seychelles remained uninhabited. Navigators were wary of the many coral reefs to the south of the archipelago so they preferred to take longer but safer routes to the trading posts in India. There are rocks and reefs scattered just about everywhere in these waters. Back in the sailing days, they used to make a wide detour to try to avoid the Seychelles Bank when they were coming from South Africa and heading to India. Given the difficulties they had with positioning and, of course, hydrography and cartography, which were inexistent, more often than not, they had about a 50-50 chance of making it through. And there are, in fact, a lot of wrecks in this area. The Arab navigators, however, had been crisscrossing the Indian Ocean for ages. They would take advantage of the winter monsoon winds to sail from India towards the African coast. Then, later, between October and May, they'd use the summer monsoons to make the return trip, and so they were probably the first to discover the Seychelles. It's important to remember that the Indian Ocean is the oldest sea where there was commercial traffic. India had a civilization, the Mohenjo-Daro, that was much older than Egypt. 3,000 years BC, there were powerful kingdoms, maritime kingdoms. Then from the 7th century on, the Arabs became very powerful because they controlled the spice trade out of India and Ceylon. But maybe, you know, as the Arabs traded all over, you never know. Maybe one of these days we'll discover a manuscript in India, in Iran or in Iraq, indicating that the Arabs were the first ones to land on the Seychelles. Leaving Mai, we set sail for Silhouette. Since the Arab navigators were sailing by the stars and following the rhythm of the monsoon winds, all their voyages were perilous. Did they reach the Seychelles? Only a few vestiges, an Arab name, Lance Lascar, taken from one of the early Portuguese charts, give us reason to believe that they may have landed on the east coast of Silhouette.
These are the graves of the Arab navigators. Here in this spot, at that time the sea didn't come in as far, so there were also graves where the beach is now. The history of the Seychelles tells that there are Arabs buried here on Silhouette, and this spot is called Anslaska. Except for the rare incursions by Arab navigators or pirates, Silhouette remained uninhabited for a long time and its vegetation intact. The small plantations of copra, which is dried coconut meat, the source of coconut oil, have now been abandoned. The 200 inhabitants of the island have gone over to more profitable crops like cinnamon or, even better, ecotourism. For many years now, Ron Gerlach, an environmental activist, has been working here in his small laboratory on Silhouette for the preservation and the propagation of the Seychelles turtle. Uh, the very first record, written record, we have of explorers finding the tortoises was from a man called John Jourdain, who was based on a group of three small ships which um, visited North Island. And they actually collected some tortoises and put them on the ships for food. But what he wrote in his journal was that the men didn't like to eat them because they were so ugly. But after a while they actually got used to eating them. When the settlers came, and the first thing they did was they started collecting the tortoises and selling them to the ships for food. Because a giant tortoise like Adam back there, you can leave in the ship for six months with no food and no water, and he would still be alive. And you could then have fresh meat on the ship. And we know that from the archives, because we still have records in the archives, that at sometimes they sold 400, 500, 600 tortoises to one ship. In fact, they used to take sometimes the ballast, the rocks that were in the sailing ships, out and put the tortoises in their place. The tortoises that we have here on Silhouette, for instance the Aldabra tortoise, is a very round tortoise, nice high dome tortoise. The others that we have that we've brought over from wherever we've been able to find them are the Seychelles giant tortoise, which is a flat tortoise but with the scoots which stand up like little hills on the top. And mm. What, mm. what you're listening to there is the love song of a giant tortoise. Mm. Mm. Even though it's probable that Arab or Indian navigators landed here, there is no tangible proof, so there will always be a question mark. And the pirates of the Seychelles that were supposed to have landed here? Another legend steeped in mystery. Towards the end of the 17th century, the golden age of piracy was drawing to a close in the Caribbean. The pirates were tracked down by the great colonial naval powers, captured and hanged. That's when a few diehards set sail for the Indian Ocean. 
Spices, Madras cloth, silk and porcelain from China, gold and precious stones, such were the treasures that filled the ships sailing from India and Ceylon to Europe. The French and English ships which would sail through the Mozambique Channel between Madagascar and the African coastline became the ideal prey for these new pirates of the Indian Ocean. There were an estimated 500 pirates in the region. Among them, a few celebrities from the Caribbean days, like the English pirates Captain Kidd and Captain Avery, known as Long Ben, and the Frenchman Le Vasseur, nicknamed the Buzzard. For about 30 years, up until around 1730, they would board any and all ships crossing the zone. Once, they even attacked a ship of the Grand Mogul, on board, they found not only precious stones and 100,000 piastres, but also the ravishing daughter of the Indian sovereign. What did they do with their booty? Did they hide it away on Madagascar and certain of the Seychelles Islands, as was thought at the time? Nobody knows. It's said that when the buzzard was on the gallows about to be hanged, the noose already around his neck, he bellowed to the crowd, My treasure goes to whoever can find it. And so the legend of the Seychelles as Treasure Islands was born. There is hidden treasure on the Seychelles. Just ask the people. Sometimes they may be a bit reluctant to talk about it. The most famous treasure they hunt for is the hidden treasure of Olivier Le Vasseur known as the Buzzard. He's buried on Reunion Island, and it's said that he and the notorious Englishman John Taylor laid their hands on the greatest treasure ever, worth billions. There was an Indian princess on her way to Portugal with all her treasure, and they managed to make off with all of it. The buzzard was very intelligent, not to mention cunning, and it seems that he went to great lengths to hide the treasure so that no one would ever find it. People will see signs on rocks, for example, strange signs, and then that's where they'll dig for treasure, and they have dreams. That's why there are people searching all over. No one has ever said they've found treasure, but everyone is out looking for it. All this time for the little point there, okay. he had a treasure. In May, Paul Richard, a carpenter, spends most of his time and money on treasure hunting. He's been digging in different spots along the shore for more than 10 years, with nothing to show for it. Now he's resorting to Indians. They claim that guided by the powers of a kind of shaman, they have found many buried treasures in their own country. So, while they're waiting for the master to arrive, Paul takes his new partner to see one of his old digs. He had been drawn here by some strange orders, and he was sure he was on the right track. But in the end, he came up empty-handed. So, as the law stipulates, he had to fill in the huge hole that he had dug. A person told me once that he dreamt of gold. Someone in his dream told him, dig there, there's something there. He asked me to come with him. When the pirates came here, they had their hiding places, in the lowlands, in the mountains, Although there were lots of signs, marks, in lots of places we looked, there were markings on the rocks, snakes, boats, scales. I dug and dug and dug, didn't find a thing. It's a lot of work, 
You dig? And when you don't find anything, you'll have to start all over. When someone dreams of a new spot, you have to get government authorization. And you have to leave 25,000 rupees deposit before they'll let you dig. Things would happen in some of those places. You move a rock one day, and when you come back the next, you can't budge it. Impossible. A mystery. But you can't help it. The more you dig, the more you want to dig. Le Ponant is leaving Silhouette and heading south for the Amirantes. Up until the end of the 18th century, none of the maritime routes used by the major colonial powers passed through the Seychelles. The Dutch chose to sail due east. Even though the route was longer, it had the advantage of avoiding the seasonal monsoon winds. The English sailing ships, after rounding the Cape of Good Hope, would sail up along the African coast in order to reach Ceylon. As for the French, they would strike out from Ile de France, then, after avoiding the perilous Seychelles bank, would follow the English route. Even though it was a Frenchman, Lazare Picot, sailing from Ile de France, who discovered the Seychelles in 1742, it was several decades before French ships would venture into the region. Chevalier Grenier, exploring the Desroches Atoll in 1770, noted down in his logbook. January 10th, our men went to visit the island. We took 32 sea turtles and a good number of birds that we killed by hitting them with sticks. We learned that it was encircled by coral at about an eighth of a league out, that the reefs abound with fish, with sharks, rays, and that there were many turtles. The island is separated in two, east and west, by a channel that is high and dry at low tide. These coral islands are nicknamed the oil islands because of the copra and coconut oil they used to produce here. Most of them are now wildlife sanctuaries where pleasure boats are not allowed to land without official permission. What characterizes these islands is that they're all very flat, as you can see. Unlike the archipelago of Granite Islands, the archipelago of the Seychelles proper. And all these islands are very recent. They're at most a few million years old. They are, in fact, sandbanks where the vegetation took hold and flourished. The interesting thing about this atoll is the surprising diversity of life forms, aquatic life in particular. All around you can see rays, small sharks, 
turtles, and we also have many different types of migratory and resident birds. The main difference between the Seychelles archipelago and the Amaranth archipelago is that on the Seychelles there are endemic species of terrestrial birds that have evolved right there and that you can find only in that archipelago. Whereas here, in the Amaranths, these are much younger islands, so there's not been enough time for new species or subspecies to appear. Like the surface of the atoll, the reef, relatively undisturbed by human activity, is teeming with an incredible variety of underwater life. Taking advantage of the rising wind, we reluctantly leave the St. Joseph Atoll and the Amarantes. There are 200 kilometers to cover during the night to reach the archipelago of the Seychelles and Cousin, our next port of call. Prala, Mai, Silhouette, the Amarantes, Cousin. You don't have to pore over mysterious signs carved into the rocks or go digging up the ground to discover the treasure of the Seychelles. It's right there in front of your eyes, in the beauty of the islands, in the wealth of plant and animal life, in the nature, quite simply. That's a fairy tern, or a white tern. It's also called a Holy Ghost bird. It's quite unique, and it has all those names because of its all-white plumage. It has very black eyes, and the beak is a kind of light blue, and then gets deep blue towards the point. It's special because it doesn't build a nest. The female lays her single egg in the hollow of a branch or the fork of a tree. That's where they'll nest, that's where they'll incubate the egg, and where the chick will hatch.
There are about two million birds here. The number varies, but there's always a peak when the seabirds arrive. That's the maximum. There used to be a lot of agriculture going on here, mainly coconuts. This used to be a coconut grove, and the original forest had been completely cleared to plant the coconut grove. Then a scientific expedition came here and they saw that a particular species of bird was in danger of becoming extinct, a bird native to the Seychelles. And that's why the environmental organizations raised the money to buy the island, to turn it into a nature reserve. It was not until the second half of the 18th century that France, at war with England, began to see the need of sailing the Seychelles route. Not only would the passage between Ile de France and their Indian possession of Pondicherry be shortened from three months to 20 days, but also this new route would allow them to develop the Seychelles colony. Marion Dufresne, in a letter to Louis XIV dated August 14, 1769, addresses this question. It seems superfluous to further argue the advantage of a shorter route to India, especially since it would afford a port of call in the Seychelles that could provide emergency aid and a safe mooring place. The vessels, particularly in wartime, could carry out repairs, renew their supplies and reach India in 20 days of sailing. Mapped, measured, and marked, the maritime routes are now, at least theoretically, 100% safe. But the authorities of the Seychelles, in their concern to protect the environment, have regulated the maritime traffic in their territorial waters. Here's the main island of the archipelago, Mahe, and Victoria, its port. You can really see how on either side you have a zone with a limited access. It's even marked on the charts in big letters, area to be avoided. That's why the commercial ships don't use it. There's just one channel to access the port of Mahé, the main island of the Seychelles. It runs north-south and the ship have to use it. But for the ships that don't stop at Victoria on Mahé, we recommend the routes that pass either much further to west of the Seychelles and Emirante Banks, or much further east. That's why you see hardly any ships on this route. Last port of call on this voyage, La Digue. This one island is the epitome of all the beauty of the Seychelles and has remained a haven of tranquility. Life and work are one at the same tranquil pace as in the old days.
Maybe they're trying to respect tradition, protect the environment, or save energy. In any case, this old Zebu-powered press continues to extract coconut oil from the copra pulp. In this little shipyard, they repair the traditional light schooners. The Jolly Roger displayed on the bow of this boat piques our curiosity about the famous treasure. And the fact that the most beautiful beach on the island has the evocative name of En Source d'Argent, Source of Money Cove, is even more intriguing. This jumble of pink granite boulders polished smooth by erosion and thrusting up from the turquoise sea has become the symbol of the Seychelles, a symbol that embodies the whole geological history of the archipelago. The Seychelles was once at the center of a massive supercontinent called Gondwana. And uh, at uh, 225 million years, there was a split in Gond the Gondwana continent, which separated into two. So Seychelles, India, Madagascar, uh, drifted away from the African continent. And at about 60 million years, India separated from Seychelles. And as a result, Seychelles became isolated in the middle of the ocean and India continued north and collided into Asia. And the interesting part as well is at 60 million years that was a catastrophic time in the Earth's history and as a result there was a lot of volcanism and uh, Amirant arcs which is the volcanic ridges were formed as a result of the separation of India from Seychelles. Uh, what's interesting at this site is that we have these corals that's found about up to 10 meters above sea level. And that's uh, evidence that the sea level was much higher in the past. And these corals have been dated at 100, about 130,000 years. So it's not very old compared to the granite that it's, uh, it's, it's on. The granite, as you remember, has been dated at 750 million years. May, 6 a.m. On Beauvalon Beach, the fishermen are heading out in their parole. Less than 100 meters from shore, they let out their huge net. A few moments later, other fishermen on the shore, along with passers-by, all pitch in and begin to draw the net slowly in.
Little by little, the trap closes. Once the net is upon the beach, we get a look at the catch. Hundreds of fish, an incredible diversity of species. A miraculous draft of fishes, a gift from the gods and from the sea, a fantastic treasure renewed day after day, booty to shame the fiercest pirates. Everyone pursues his own dream, and Emmanuel's dream has come true. He has found a treasure. These few pieces of porcelain and ingots of copper won't make him rich, but the experience has given him a more philosophical outlook. Everybody wants to be rich, and it's easy to break open a chest or something, and you get richer overnight. That's what most people are interested in, but very few treasure hunters are really interested in the history of our country or want to find something that could be good for our country. On the other hand, it's good for tourism in the Seychelles. It brings in tourists who want to see or maybe even find treasure themselves. Far from the temptations of modern life, the musicians of the group Massezarine respect the tradition of meeting on the beaches of Ladigue. They gather around the campfire, and to the pulsing drums they perform the mutya, the traditional dance that is a blend of Indian, African, and European influences.